Here we see a funeral pyre done by Virgil on vellum or parchment, vellum being calfskin, parchment being lambskin. These materials replaced papyrus. Next we see a scene where we can vaguely see a farmhouse and the person on the far right is Virgil. You can tell by he's holding a stylus. The person on the left is the overseer. They're trying to make farming look wonderful. Now we're moving on to the Apollinaire. The Church of St. Apollinaire was built in the traditional basilical style, except it didn't include an art, a, a transept, I'm sorry. The apse of St. Apollinaire is a beautiful creation, we'll see that in a moment, of the Transfiguration of Christ. As you can see here, you do not include the transept in this Church of St. Apollinaire. You have an apse, you have the nave down the middle, you have two aisles down the side, and you have the narthex on the very bottom. Uh, who exactly Saint Apollinaire was, I am not sure, um, but he wasn't the famous French poet, of course. Now we're looking at the Transfiguration of Christ, a beautiful scene located in the apse of the Church of Saint Apollinaire. As as all these scenes are, everything you see here is an intentional. The two sheep on the right opposed to the one sheep on the left. The twelve sheep in the foreground representing the twelve apostles. You can tell by this art that there has been a switch into this Byzantine style of art, where the landscape is made of abstract elements and, you know, there is a gold background. Now we're looking down the nave of the Santa Polinaire church in Classe Ravenna, Italy. Um, circa 5429. Moving on to the Vienna Genesis, uh, made probably between 500 AD and 520 AD. They're a continuous narrative. Um, they are the first to have biblical scenes. Uh, the writing on them is liquid silver. There's 96 folios or sections. Um, 26 have survived. Right now we're seeing we just saw, or we're seeing right now, Rebecca, and the one we saw before was Rebecca at the Well. Both were Rebecca at the Well. And moving on to the great Hagia Sophia, first built in 360 but burned down in 404 uh, during the reign of Constantinus. Uh, it was rebuilt by Justinian in 532. It took him only four years to rebuild, 532 to 536. On the left in this photograph, we see the differences in the pedentive column which was used in Hagia Sophia that doesn't have the squinches that were previously used. Hagia Sophia was designed by two famous architects, Isidorus and Anthemolius. Isidorus spelled I-S-I-D-O-R-U-S -S, and Anthemolius, I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing, spelled A-N-T-H-E-M-E-I-O-S. What we have just seen was the dome of Hagia Sophia, which is said to, on a beautiful day when the lights are shining in, appear as it is floating, which is another great testament to the work of the architects. You can see in these columns that Justinian has left his mark, and they have also moved kind of toward an abstract, decorative style of art. Justinian's sign being in the middle. Again, we're getting another view of the beautiful dome of Hagia Sophia. Uh, it served as a church until the city was conquered by the Ottoman Turks and taken under the leadership of Mehmet II and he converted it into a mosque. After this conversion, Islamic additions were made inside and out. The minarets, which are the four uh, tall towers that call people to prayer on the outside, um, were put up, and a lot of the ancient art that was on the walls was Looking at this plan of Hagia Sophia, we can tell that it once included an atrium. That atrium is no longer there. Again, the interior of Hagia Sophia. Twelve years after the Turkish Republic was established by the order of Kemal Ataturk, it became a museum and remains so today. 
now known as Ea Sophia, the Church of Divine Wisdom, it stands as one of the landmarks of the city of Istanbul in Turkey. Here we can see the four minarets standing around the outside of the church, not originally put in by the Christians. And again, another outline of the church, a very intricately complicatedly designed church by Isidorus and Anthony Mollis. Anthony being a name I cannot pronounce. Moving on to the mosaics of Saint Vital, here we can see how they were made by little crushed pieces of glass in this case, sometimes it could be stone. Uh, this is on the apse, I think. Central from 548 AD. Here we're looking at a picture of Justinian. On his right, the clergy, including Archbishop Maximus, and on the left, the secular officials, including military officers who bear the Christinian monogram. Now we're looking at Justinian's wife, who may have formerly been a prostitute, I think is the story. She is Theodora, and a big part of Justinian's life, the scene must be understood symbolically rather than literally. Here we see it from another side. Maybe that's the story of Justinian. The drapery and the feet and everything else in the story are more abstract than anything else. Moving on to the Rosanna Codex, a codex being a book, we see Jesus before Pontius Pilate with Barabbas. Uh, the Roman faces and the Roman dress are, are blatantly apparent, and this is from the story of Halo, made on the royal color of purple vellum. And vellum, of course, being in the skin of a calf or a lamb. A lambskin being parchment. Here we see an encaustic of Mary holding Christ. Encaustic, of course, being the method of mixing hot wax with pigment on wood, in this case. And we see that draperies have started to become less realistic than in Roman times. Moving on to the Rabula Gospel from Zagba. Nobody quite knows where Zagba was. It was a monastery. We see the style as an impressionistic, impressionistic bold, sketchy. Um, it's written in Syriac. That last image was one of the earliest crucifixions. Here we see Mary standing orant, which means her arms are up, looking toward Jesus. Um, the sketchy style adds a lot of movement, and in these pictures we see a, a zigzag border. border, which adds to the excitement. Moving right along to Sutton Hoo. Sutton Hoo was discovered by Mrs. Pretty uh, in Suffolk, England, who gave it back to England. It was a ship that was discovered, buried previously, but full of treasure. Our first piece of treasure being this gold cloisson garnet, um, checkered, blue glass hinged shoulder clasps, which every bit was decorated. And that was something that we came to the Sutton Hoo ceremonial mask that the British Museum restored that was found. Um, there are immediate comparisons between these ones and masks from the Vendel Age in the eastern part of Sweden. There are only four of this kind of helmet in, in England, and it probably belonged to King Rywald of East Anglia. The width is probably about eight inches, and it's very heavy, maybe seven pounds or more. Quickly looking at a Germanic fibula pin, um, an example of jewelry of Germanic art, abstract and never wanting to have any sort of emptiness, so completely filled, densely. Uh, they had horror vacui reflected. This is again from Sutton Hoo. It's a purse cover about 15 centimeters long. Uh, it's gold. It's made of symmetrically arranged things. You see the man and the beasts in there, the interlacing, the eagles attacking the ducks. And finishing Animal with the Annunciation from Constantinople made of silk and twill, 33 centimeters by 70 centimeters. The Europeans Brought, got the silk. Um, this is Gabriel telling Mary she's pregnant with Jesus flanked by. Had to rush quite a bit there, but hope you enjoyed and hope you learned something, a little something about the history of medieval art, and you'll check out my next video. Thank you.